Video games based upon already existing series and characters always got a bad rep, mostly for good reason. But that doesn't stop the fact that there have been some pretty amazing games that come from IPs that weren't video games first. Some will utilize the source material to make a great representation of that world within a video game, or the game will use the source material as a base and give their own interpretation of that series, world, and characters. So when looking at my favorite superhero, Spider-Man, I'm sure you can imagine how much I love Insomniac's Spider-Man from 2018. In my opinion, this game has stronger characters than most of the movies and shows do, and the gameplay is peak spider bliss. So this is the definitive Spider-Man experience, but what was it before this game? Some would say 2004 Spider-Man 2, based upon the Sam Raimi film, was the best due to its web-swinging mechanics being revolutionary for the wall crawler, and there is a lot of merit to that, but for me personally, it wasn't my favorite. We got Web of Shadows later on, which had fun gameplay but was pretty bad overall, Shattered Dimensions that was a love letter to longtime fans, and movie games upon movie games galore. For me though, up until Insomniac Spider-Man stole the show, my favorite game based upon the character was Neversoft's Endeavor from the year 2000, simply titled Spider-Man. <laughs> Yeah, Spider-Man's first 3D endeavor was my go-to game based upon the webhead, the PlayStation 1 version specifically. It did have ports to the Nintendo 64, Dreamcast, and Windows PC, but I'll talk about those later on. Oh, I guess there was a Game Boy Color version too, but who cares. Spider-Man was developed by Neversoft, which wasn't that the first name for Viagra? Utilizing that glorious Tony Hawk engine, this is one of the very, very few Neversoft games with an action-oriented gameplay style, and it's the only 3D game they developed that had a focus on melee combat. And it's a shame, as much as I love the Neversoft-developed Tony Hawk games, I would have loved to see them push what they started in Spider-Man further. Well, regardless of that, this game was my definitive Spider-Man game up until the Insomniac one. But with that game now existing, is there any reason to go back to this game other than nostalgia? Well, let's get into it. The plot of Spider-Man revolves around the title character being framed for stealing a device from a now apparently reformed Doc Ock that does... something? This event also causes longtime rival Eddie Brock to once again don the symbiote suit known as Venom who vows to make Spider-Man pay for this apparent crime. Shortly after, shadowy figures release a dense fog into the city because the PS1 could only render so much. So, Spider-Man has to clear his name, shut down the fog, and figure out who's behind all of this, all while dealing with Venom and other villains who pop up during the story. Look, guys. Hey, will you guys keep it down? Hey, loosen up, kids! I'm on fire! I'll be the first to say that the plot set up in this game isn't really the best. What was the device that the imposter Spider-Man stole? Why is Doc Ock reformed? What is the threat level of this fog? The fog literally is not mentioned by anyone until near the end of the game when, spoilers, Mysterio tells Spider-Man that it's apparently meant to prepare the populace for symbiosis. So why did Doc Ock need to pretend to be reformed? Oh yeah, he's the mastermind behind the plot, big surprise I know, and he wants to take over the world with symbiotes so he can rule over them? What kind of end goal is that? The sense of urgency is virtually none for most of the game, everyone's just doing crime as usual. Arthur, shut up and dial 911! Scorpion's here, and you have to- I get that the fog's there for hardware limitations, but shoehorning in a reason for it within the plot only really works if you actually mention it or make it more of a threat. The plot is not strong here at all, but what saves it is the strong characterization this game has. Every character and situation here fits the Spider-Man world perfectly. And keep in mind, before this, the closest video game to actually give personality to these characters was Spider-Man The Sinister Six, and that game was, uh... Are you alright, Mr. Mason? Get away from me! Call the police! He tried to kill me! Wait a minute, I tried to save you! No. Spider-Man is voiced by Reno Romano, who had previously done the role in the Spider-Man Unlimited show. Same show that Jennifer Hale voiced Black Cat and Mary Jane, whom of which also reprises her role. Ephraim Zimbalist Jr. reprises his role as Doc Ock from the 1994 Spider-Man cartoon, and it's such a fun, unique villain voice. Technology is the light that will cut through the darkness. When humanity conforms to a single truth... Perfect. Perfect. Those who cannot share my vision will be crushed by it. And the rest of the characters are voiced by Darren Norris and D. Bradley Baker. Each character is portrayed perfectly, it's like they're in a Saturday morning cartoon, and this is the Spider-Man that I always think of first when thinking of the character. Reno Romano gives him the perfect voice for a more experienced Spider-Man. He's got the cocky mannerisms and quick wit to his humor that Spider-Man is known for. Venom's ugly face on that big screen? Now that's scary. Oh, I hope they don't mind if I make a quick deposit. I'm sorry guys, am I late for the party? The heating bill for this place must be enormous. And I thought crime didn't pay. He even manages to pull out a more serious tone during the segment where Venom kidnapped Mary Jane. Where's my wife, you symbiote freak? You can run, Venom, but you can't hide! Why, Venom? Why did you come back? <laughs> Darren Norris as Venom is also a role I really like. Again. 
innocence falls prey to the evil of Spider-Man. He's a lot less serious and jokey than Venom normally is, which yes, is always more interesting, but this Venom fits the Saturday morning cartoon vibe, and hey, if you like the most recent Venom movies, then you'll probably appreciate this Venom. Where, where, where? What a wuss. Where'd Spider Wuss go? Spider Wuss! Come out and play! <laughs> Another factor that makes this game feel like a cartoon is the cameos from other Marvel characters during the game's plot. Daredevil, Human Torch, Punisher, and Captain America. Very short cameos, but fun nonetheless. No thanks, Mr. Deathwish. I'd like to keep the body count low if you don't mind. Fair enough. And of course, I can't talk about the characters and voice acting without mentioning the narrator, the one and only, late, great Stanley. Welcome, true believers and newcomers alike. Spider-Man co-creator Stan Lee here. Once again, we find our hero Peter Parker, better known around the world as the amazing Spider-Man in a heap of trouble. But this is just the beginning, Spidey fans. So get ready for a true superhero action thriller, packed to the brim with thrills and chills, twists and turns, more super villains than you can shake a web at, and of course, non-stop web-slinging, wall-crawling action. The way this man could talk so enthusiastically about what's going on in the game's story is something I really kept with me when I first played this as a kid. Stanley's narration is a nice tone setter, but my favorite thing about this game is the vibe it portrays with the art style and soundtrack. The art is clearly based upon the Todd McFarlane Spider-Man illustrations, you can especially see it when looking at the storyboards for the cutscenes. For the first 3D Spider-Man game, you want an art style that can not only work on low-poly models, but the textures that at the time were the best they could have used. So an art style with high contrast and heavily exaggerated proportions on the clothing designs worked really well. Most of the character models in the game look awesome, and not just for the low-poly PS1 aesthetic, but they just look good in this art style in general. Well, most of them. The uncover faces can look a little... Dark Souls 1 enemy-like. Regardless, the models look great, but what brings it together is the awesome soundtrack composed by the one and only Tommy Tallarico. Hey, guys, 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 hold on, hold on a second, hold on a second. I, I know how, I know how we're gonna figure this dispute out. I got, I have the end-all, be-all game, okay? It's called Russian Roulette. The soundtrack for Spider-Man you normally hear is more of an orchestrated score, since they're more commonly associated with the various film series, even if not directly related to any particular film. And while that works on its own, Spider-Man opts for a more grungy, rock-oriented soundtrack, heavily inspired by industrial rock and new metal. And it's rad. <laughs> If I had to give any criticism to the soundtrack, it's that a lot of the songs are very short. Which for a video game, yeah, they should be, but a lot of the times they're like, 30 second loops? Really cool 30 second loops though, the grunginess of the soundtrack really makes this game stand out amongst all the other Spider-Man games. Now the biggest factor for many to make a good Spider-Man game is how good the gameplay is, and moreover, how much does the game do the character of Spider-Man justice? Well, the gameplay isn't bad, but if you're looking for a good web swinging game, well, dude, this is the PS1, what'd you expect?
The web swinging kind of automatically tracks you to a location you can land on, and the web's attached to nothing, so no real physics involved here. You do still get the ability to crawl on walls, so the level designs get to have a lot of variety between large gaps and tall constructs to swing between, and both vertical and horizontal interior designs. For a PS1 game, this was probably pretty fresh and new when it first released. The levels do feel very video gamey, since there's usually only one path to go. There are collectible comic books to find in each level, which lead to some bonus content. Other than that, there's no real reason to stray from the critical path. The combat is fine, nothing too crazy. You got your punch and kick combos, not much mixing of the two, but there's not a whole lot of reason to since they're pretty much the same when it comes to attack strength and speed. You can web enemies to slow them down, and you get a few different abilities with the webs depending on what direction you push along with the web button, which makes for at least a little bit of variety. The enemies themselves are pretty easy to beat early on. Once you have to start fighting lizards and symbiotes, though, things do get a bit more challenging since they can take a lot more hits. The biggest issue here is the lack of enemy variety. There are a lot of different enemy types technically, but they never get mixed. Every level you only get one enemy type, and that does make the combat get quite repetitive early on. Luckily, most of the time you don't need to fight every enemy in a level. The boss battles, on the other hand, are really fun. They each have unique movesets and means of defeating them, and they definitely are the highlight of the game in my opinion. Especially that final escape sequence against the only real original creation for this game, Monster Ock, which scared the fuck out of me as a kid. <laughs> Spider-Man set a standard for the rest of the Spider-Man games to come after with having an array of extra content. You got various training modes which are fun enough and you can view the comic books you collect which is nice to see a little bit of Spider-Man's history. But the feature that we all love to see that this game started was the selection of extra costumes that you can wear during gameplay. These were so cool to see back in the day and they got some absolute bangers here too. Scarlet Spidey is still my favorite look for Spider-Man but you also got the symbiote suit, Spider-Man 2099, Captain Freaking Universe, Peter Parker, Oh, and everyone's favorite, the Bombastic Bag Man. Each costume has unique abilities to make the game easier or harder, which is interesting. From infinite web or invincibility, to being able to carry less web, so if you want to make hard mode harder, knock yourself out. There were other versions of the game on different consoles, and their differences are... interesting. The Nintendo 64 version is very limited compared to the PS1 version. No pre-rendered cutscenes, just screenshots and text. <laughs> The already short music tracks are even shorter, which just sounds silly. Other than that, they're pretty similar, so it's passable for sure, but compared with the PS1 version, it's clear which is better. The Dreamcast and PC versions came out a whole year later and do have some quote-unquote improvements. All the models are retextured to look better, and yeah, the corpse faces from before are definitely better now, except for Doc Ock, he kinda looks like he belongs with the original PS1 crowd. And while yeah, the textures are better, it sorta makes the models look a little worse, since these are still low-poly models, and with more detail you can clearly see where the technical limitations come to. And some of the character models do look straight up better with this new art style, but I still prefer the less detailed textures. Another thing is sometimes Spider-Man's hands will actually open. How about... Ew. Yeah, this is why we don't have any lip movements. PS1 animation is rough, and seeing an open hand move so unnaturally compared to the closed fist that just works so much better given the limitations, it really makes a graphical upgrade look more like a mod rather than an actual upgrade. The game still runs perfectly fine though, so if you prefer the graphical updates then these versions are for you. Though why did they change the voice of some of the enemies? Hey. <laughs> <laughs> That just sounds... silly. The last thing to talk about with Spider-Man is the array of easter eggs in the game. Gee, I wonder who those pumpkin bombs belong to. Lots of stuff scattered across the levels, sure. But what about a whole easter egg mode? I am the Watcher. You already know the outcome of Spider-Man's battle with Dr. Octopus, Carnage, and the symbiotes. But what if... But if this time, in this time's dream, some of the events unfolded differently. The what if mode activates when you enter in this weird code, and after you get a message from one of the watchers from Marvel lore, there will be minor changes throughout the game. I'm in a. <laughs> Alternate 
different paths, silly animations, voice changes, and just little things to find. I am Minion! It doesn't go as hard as it should, every game needs a what-if type mode. The concept is so cool that I wish this game did more with the concept. Hey, is this the Ark of the Covenant? So, Spider-Man doesn't necessarily hold up in every regard, but its shortcomings aren't detrimental to the overall experience. This is a very PS1 type game, even if you play other ports of the game. And I feel like this is a game you'd want to play if you love the character of Spider-Man. It has a unique vibe compared to the more clean-cut modern interpretations of the Web Slinger, and while I can't say that this is my favorite Spider-Man game anymore, it's still one of them. And at the very least, it's fun, and that's all I really want when it comes to a game based on my favorite superhero. So Neversoft may have not had a chance to make another action game, but there was a direct sequel to the Spider-Man game in 2001. It was exclusive to the PS1 and developed by Vicarious Visions, who worked on the Game Boy Color port of Spider-Man. They would go on to primarily be a third-party dev for portable consoles. That sequel is Spider-Man 2, Enter Electro, and a mini-review of this game. If you like the first Spider-Man game, you'll probably like this one since it's just more of that, but it's also not as good as the first one. No Tommy Tallarico soundtrack, so it loses some of the charm the original had. The levels aren't as fun, and few have some downright lame objectives. And the plot, while probably not being any better than the original games, it kind of loses a lot when the overall simple but effective vibe of the original game is lost. So yeah, not the best sequel, but it's there if you're dying for more PS1 Spider-Man. The original Spider-Man got pretty good reviews, hence why there was a sequel, but Neversoft would go on to primarily develop the Tony Hawk franchise of games. The second of which, Pro Skater 2, features Spider-Man as a playable character as sort of cross-promotion. Tony Hawk! Hey, I skated with that guy! As for Spider-Man... Well, it's fucking Spider-Man. Sure, the specific line of games may have stopped, but with the popularity of the various cartoons and movies that came thereafter, we got tons of Spider-Man games, more than you can count. Some good, some bad. The 2018 game developed by Insomniac, though, is the best one, no contest. Amazing controls, a spectacular story, and the ultimate amount of characterization that you need for a game based on the wall crawler. And while that may be the case, the original PS1 Spider-Man game will always hold a special place in my heart. That game was how I became familiar with the character, hell, it's how I discovered him. And ever since then, he's been my favorite superhero. I've seen every movie, at least checked out most of the shows, and played as many of the games as I could get my hands on. And up until the 2018 game, none would ever beat that original PS1 game for me. Maybe it's its simplistic nature or its awesome vibe, but this game deserves to be held up as one of the greatest Spider-Man games ever made. So why not re-release it digitally for like 10 bucks and call it Spider-Man 2000? Or even a remaster to give it new life? Or even a remake from the ground up to try to capture an audience like me who would love to see a new clear look at this Spider-Man? Or, or, since the sequel to Insomniac Spider-Man is gonna have Venom in it, why not remake that game in the form of DLC for Spider-Man 2? That would be really ambitious to remake a whole game as DLC for another game, but I'd be here for it for sure. Well, regardless of that, I know I'm gonna come back to this game many, many times for the rest of my life. It might be janky, and it's not as good as the newest series, but that doesn't stop it from being one of my favorite games based upon my favorite superhero. And, to end off my video about one of the games that helped shape me into who I am today, this.